I try so hard each day to shed a little light To keep each moment of my life both full and bright Believing in the feeling that I know is right with me to the book of Revelation as we're to be talking about our future. I think a lot of people want to know what the future has to hold for us, especially when we see, it seems like every day that we now live in a, a world once again where we're threatened by nuclear missiles. And I heard on the news today where they were saying that in a year's time, the guy over in North Korea will have the, the ability to launch a missile that will be able to go nuclear nuclear all the way to New York City. I mean, they, if that to happen, they have to pass my house, you know. And, and so there's things that we need to be concerned about for our future. But also, our future, I think, so we think of our own personal experience. What, what's my life going to bring to me? And, and I think that it really, really is, breaks down is my relationship that I have with Jesus Christ. If my relationship with God is right, my future is glorious. It's a, we have a great future, but my future is not well. Well, then we have troubles, don't we? As we were in last week's study, remember we were in heaven. In Revelation chapter 4 and 5, as the church is in heaven. As we go now, as we move to chapter 6, we start moving into a time where we're, we're in the heavenly scene, but now the, the whole emphasis is going to be shift back to this earth. Where we were at last week, as you remember the week before, is John was able to get that heavenly peak, able to see what was going on in heaven. And as he went in there, he saw the lamb as he was slain. As he saw that, that amazing picture, we'll let, you, we'll let you, you can get the phone. That's okay. <laughs> that beautiful picture of the lamb that was there on the throne of God. And the beauty is, is that as John looked there and he, and he wept as he saw this book that no man was able to take. As he cried out, as he said, he says, he goes, who's worthy to take the book and to loose the seal thereof? Then thank be unto God that Jesus rose up, the lamb that was slain, in order to grab that book. And what we finished up, of course, is in chapter 5, is that picture around the throne of God where all these millions and millions of angels are breaking forth in worship as Jesus takes the scroll as he stands up and everybody celebrates that he has taken the scroll. As we mentioned, we believe that scroll is the title deed for this earth. I, uh, the title deed that was lost there in Je Genesis, where man forfeited their right to this earth, as God had given the responsibility to tend and keep this earth, but yet now it's been lost. Well, that which was lost is now victorious over what Jesus accomplished for us. I thought it was fitting, as we, Larry was sharing in communion tonight, as he was describing what, we were, what it took in order for us to be forgiven, but also what it took in order for this earth, this planet, this world that we know to be redeemed back unto God, as we open up at verse 1. And it says, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the, one of the seals, and I heard as it was a noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, come and see, or otherwise just come, take a look at it. And the book, of course, was these seals around it, it was a scroll, the best we could picture to it, it was like a locked chapter, where the chapters of the book were locked, and now they're being opened. In verse 2, and he says, and I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him had a bow. And a crown was given unto him, and he went forth a conquering and to conquer. You remember, the church is gone. It's been raptured up, and the restraining force against evil has now been removed. 
as Paul speaks about us as being that restraining force where Satan can have his ways. This guy that's riding upon this horse, this first white horse, of course is the counterfeit Christ, known as the Antichrist. There's many names used of the Antichrist in scriptures. The most common, of course, is the Antichrist. In 2 Thessalonians, he's known as the son of perdition. He's going to rise to govern this world. He'll be the dictator over this whole world. Folks, this is right around the corner. Are one of the things in the world that we live in that we're really void of is true leadership where somebody will just step to the plate and they have complete control and the answers that the world is looking for. As the Bible tells us, as we look in the, in the book of Daniel, as you understand the way it lays out, the first three and a half years are pretty rosy when this new man comes on scene. He'll have the answer. He'll be able to come and give us peace. Isn't that what we're all looking for? Do you know how many wars are going on even this days or threats of world of wars in every con continent, continent, not to mention the terrorist threats and everything else that we're facing? Could you, could you picture that if somebody would show up and have the answer to bring peace to everybody, and that's what we're going to see. I also believe this man's going to just be a brilliant man and be able to handle the economic problems of the world. We're arguing this day in our government how we're going to even just be able to solve our health insurance problems. How we're going to be able to insure not only the wealthy, but the middle class and the poor. How can we provide insurance? We can't get that figured out. This guy's going to arrive and it's going to have all the answers. He's going to be the answer man. I believe he's going to come, as the Bible will tell us as we move forward, with supernatural powers, powers that he's received from Satan. He will actually be able to go and do the desires that Satan wants to accomplish during this time. And so the picture, I want to make sure we get it, is now we're shifting our scene from heaven back down to this earth. As this first seal is cracked open, this one that's riding on the, this horse is the Antichrist. Isn't it just like Satan? He's a counterfeiter. He's a liar from the beginning as he comes and he demands to be worshipped. Of course, that's what's going to cause all this problem, isn't it? As Daniel tells us. Three and a half years, the, the first three and a half years are going to be rosy. They're going to be good. Everybody's going to be happy. But this Antichrist it's going to rebuild the temple there in Jerusalem. He's actually going to rebuild the altar. They're going to start once again worshiping in this, uh, uh, in this rebuilt temple. And then all of a sudden this man of sin will stand into the temple in the Holy of Holies and declare that he is, is God and he begins to, or demands to be worshipped. At that point, could you imagine at that point when finally God's had enough. He's had enough of man's rebellion. He had enough of man saying, I don't need God. At this point, the wrath of God is going to pour out on man. On man. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24, verse 15, he says, When you see the abomination which was spoken by Daniel the prophet, stand it in the holy place, then flee to the wilderness. Paul tells us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that he will stand in the temple showing that he is God and declaring that he is God and demanding to be uh, worshipped as God. And so this day is coming. And so as I open, what are the future events that are going to face this world? One thing I do know is this first event where this white horse is going to come. And this man's going to come in, and he's going to create this, this false sense that he is the Messiah. In fact, everybody's going to take it like hook, line, and sinker the first three and a half years. Everything that you can imagine, all your problems are gone. But yet, God's going to have his way. In verse 3, and when he, saw, when he opened the second seal, I heard the second uh, beast say, Come, and he say, John, come take a look at this. See what's going to happen. And then there went out another horse that was red. And power was given to him that sat, upon, sat thereon to take peace from the earth, that they should 
kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. And so when you see the opening of the second seal, you're going to have wars that are bringing forth on this, for, uh, on this earth. I believe at this point, the Antichrist is going to leave a, lead a tremendous army that's going to come against the, um, not only the Jews and those that rebelled against, but there's this beautiful prophecy speaking about the kings from the east. And a lot of people believe from all the way down to China that there's going to be this war and there's going to be this time of war that's going to happen. And it, as it happens, they're going to meet in this valley this valley known as Megiddo, as they gather there and this clash of people are going to, it's just going to be just tremendous slaughter, this great slaughter of mankind, those who completely rebelled and rejected God. We're going to read further on this. We're not going to go into detail on this tonight. As we pick it up in chapter 19, as we revisit that in the book of Revelation, and so when he had opened the third seal, and of course, what we're going through here, we're given a brief description of this destruction that's going to be coming upon this earth. He says, this third seal, I heard, I heard the third beast say, come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair, pair of balances in his hands. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts saying, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And so after the battle that you see, there's really devastation upon this planet, upon this earth. There are those who believe that this war will be actually a nuclear war that's going to destroy a lot of our resources that we have. But can you imagine that you won't be able to buy barley, you won't be able to buy wheat for yourself unless, unless you have enough money to buy even a quart of it. And they estimate the cost of that quart in order to have some oats to be able to make something to eat would be basically what a man's day's wages were. You would work all day and all you would be able to get was just a, that little bit of wheat for yourself. He says, a barley, a, a barley for a penny. But did you also see in the latter part in verse 6? And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. It's interesting. They're told not to hurt the oil or the wine. Of course, the oil was representing the, those who could afford it, the luxurious life, the perfumes and so that were made out of the oil. And the wine, of course, they was made out of the barley. And so the, they had enough wa uh, barley for that in order to, for the rich to be able to make their liquor and, and to be able to live their lifestyle. But the common folks wouldn't have any barley left over at all to, to feed their family. It'll have been a, This is going to be a terrible time when this gets unfolded, when this rolls out. In verse 7. He says, when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see and look, behold, a pale horse. And his name that sat on him was Death. And hell, hell followed with him. And the power was given unto them, one fourth a part of the earth, to kill with the sword and with the hunger and with the death and with the beasts of the earth. And so now the wrath of God is being poured out to the world population. You know, they estimate today that, that our world population is something like 7.5 billion. Maybe on a low estimate, in a high estimate, it would be 8 billion people. You can see after this, it's hard to imagine that one-fourth of it could be up to 2 billion people are killed and wiped out. Because of the rejection of Jesus Christ, because uh, as his Antichrist stood up, the demand to be worshipped, finally the Lord says, enough is enough. He says, when I opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou, thou judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell upon the earth? And, and white robes were given to every one of them. And it was said unto them, 
that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren should be killed as they, sh they were sh should be fulfilled. Of course, this is a very interesting one, isn't it? Who are these people that were martyred? Who are the ones of this fifth seal that are, their, their souls are underneath the altar? The best that we could tell, I believe, is the people that probably even right now that are sitting on the fence, that enter into this time of tribulation. Do you know believers or people who confess to be Christians who really aren't living for the Lord? They're probably going to enter into this time of the Antichrist. And maybe they'll have this glee in their heart as they start thinking about their economical or problems are resolved. But also they have enough Bible knowledge when they realize that millions and millions of Christians are gone. That fear grips their heart. And I think truly during this time, this three and a half years, there's going to be this time of repentance. And, and I think it's so important that we tell people about what's going to be happening in the future if we reject Jesus Christ and we don't live with him. And see, the rapture of the church is going to happen. And there's going to be those who are going to be left behind. I'm troubled so often as I would... Be, you know, be at different churches at different places over my lifetime and, and be with my pastor as he would be sharing. And we would talk about that. I says, Pastor Chuck, you're, you're sharing such a great message. And he says, but Terry, they're not listening, are they? If they're listening, they'd be living for Jesus today. It's almost like we're waiting before the rapture to happen. Then I'm going to get right with God. That's not a good place to be. And so the best we could tell that there is going to be a, a, a bloodbath where, where finally when the Antichrist is there at the throne as he demands to be worshipped and he, he pours out his wrath upon not only the Jews but the believers and he's going to seek to kill as many as they can. And so one day they will be put in on those white robes because they put their faith in Jesus Christ. I wouldn't advise this for anybody to say, well, I'm just going to hang on and wait for that. I'm going to live the way I want to live today. That's not a good place to be at all. Encourage your friends. Pray for your friends that they would live for God today and not miss the rapture of the church. And I beheld, verse 12, when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth, of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell uh, on the earth as a fig tree casts her ultimate figs when she, uh, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. What a beautiful picture that we're seeing here of this tremendous great earthquake that we're seeing. And he says, like every fig is now being shaken off of a tree. In verse 14, it says, And the heaven departed uh, as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. We face earthquakes, and we were praying for that tremendous earthquake that down in Mexico City, as the guys were praying earlier. But this is such an earthquake that it's going to shake the world like it's never been shaken before. Earthquakes are normally what? They're localized. They're in a certain region, a certain place. We live on a fault line, and they keep on saying, it's going to shake California one day. This is bigger than what we could ever imagine. It's the whole world's going to be shaken. It says, in every mountain, in every island, we're moved out of their places. And somewhat, you get kind of sad. You mean Hawaii's going to get shifted? It's going to get moved? But you, you picture that every person on the face of the earth is going to face this earthquake. Isaiah speaks of these events where he says that heaven being rolled out like a scroll and the stars fallen from heaven in Isaiah 34 verse 4. In Isaiah 13, 13, he says the earth staggered like a, a drunken man being moved out of its place. And so this picture of this tremendous earthquake that's going to hit this world 
That is so amazing. God speaks about he's going to shake the earth once again until everything that is, tells us in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 27, until everything that can be shaken will be shaken and only those things which can't be shaken will be left. And so this earthquake quake that we see here in Revelation. Did Jesus speak about this earthquakes that are going to be happening? Yes, he did. In Matthew chapter 24, he, he spoke about these earthquakes. Joel prophesied about it in the second chapter uh, of the uh, book of Joel, where these events will happen. So the future of this earth isn't looking bright, is it? As these earthquakes are about ready to hit us. Verse 15, as we read, he says, And the kings of the earth of the earth and the great men and rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the tens in the tens and, and in the rocks of the mountain. If you had an earthquake, what would you do? You'd go fleeing, wouldn't you? You'd be looking for a safe place to go. And he said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall upon us and hide us from the face of, the, of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. That doesn't seem right when you read the laugh, uh, wrath of the Lamb. Uh, you know, the ram, I, I lamb, I've never ever heard or seen a sign that says beware of the lambs, have you? Watch out for a pit bull or watch out for a, a tiger. Watch out for a lamb. But this is going to be a time where man better pay attention. In other words, what it's saying here, as we're taking a look at this, these books and these scrolls being opened, there's no one that's going to be escaping the wrath that's going to happen. He says the rich or the, or the poor, the famous or the unknown, the people of the earth, they're going to be terrified. I, I, I always, when you look at this world, and this, really the caste systems that we live in in this world, you have the haves and the have-nots. The haves really believe they got their acts together, don't they? Well, this, as it gets poured out, doesn't discriminate against anybody. All right, it's going to come upon everybody. Even as God's love has been poured out to everybody, God has been just and given everybody an opportunity to know him, to know his forgiveness. As he, God said, he says, I love you guys, for God so loved the world. As we're talking about the world events that are going to happen, men do not need to go down this road. They can know the, the beauty of God's forgiveness. They don't have to face the, this ferocious lamb, but rather they can turn to the Lord. In verse 17, he says, For the great day of the wrath is what is come, and who shall be able to stand? There'll be no hiding place. There'll be no safe place. But there will be no safe place, no safe you know, place that you can run to. God's going to bring his judgment upon mankind. But there's safety today. There's safety today if we call upon the Lord. And he says, if we believe in our hearts and confess with our mouths that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, the Bible tells us in Romans 10 that we will be what? We will be saved. But I just need to take that step of faith to believe in my heart of, of what Jesus accomplished for me. This wrath has never been attended for the church. There are those who would like to teach that the rapture of the church won't happen until they call it post-tribulation or mid-tribulation. You know, folks, I don't believe that God has appointed any of us for wrath. Not the God that I know. He's a loving God, and he loves us so much. And if you're living for him this day, there is going to be a day right around the corner. Maybe tonight before we get home, a moment, a twinkle of an eye, we're going to be gone. I'm ready for that. The next few weeks, and you know, it's not like, oh, let's go to church tonight. Terry, Pastor Terry's speaking out of Revelation during the time of the tribulation. There's not a lot of joy in this, is it? But it's the future. It's the truth of what we're seeing. And as I see this, in Psalm 119, 
As the psalmist was taking a look at his world that he was living in, he says, rivers of water run down my eyes because they forget thy law. As I read the book of Revelation and I see these events are about ready to unfold as we not only read in Ezekiel, we read in Isaiah, as we read in Daniel, we hear Jesus speak about it in the gospel and now we have what's unfold in Revelation. Rivers of water run down my eyes for those who forget thy law, who don't know the Lord. Monday night I was speaking, well actually I think it was last Sunday morning or the Sunday morning before, can't remember now, but we were in Joshua chapter 2, and one of the most tragic verses in there is verse 10 of Judges chapter 2. They said there rose a generation who knew not the Lord, and the problem was is the first generation's experienced the things of God. The second generation heard about the things of God. And the third generation didn't even hear it. We have a responsibility to make sure that our lives are our first generation. That we experience the Lord. That we love Him. And then we go out and tell it to whoever God puts in your life. Say, who should I share the Lord with? Well, whoever God brings in your life is your responsibility to pray for them, to seek to bless them, and to share the good news of Jesus Christ. You'll never know what God might do through your life. One day, and I'll close with this. A friend of mine called me many, many years ago. I was probably 20, 21 years old. My friend named Johnny he says, Terry, let's go out and go share the gospel. We love doing that. We used to ride our, our 10 speeds all over Orange County back when I was younger. And we ended up down on Huntington Pier. And there were some people that were just laughing at some Christians coming along. And as they came walking up the pier, I was noticing this one person watching John and I. They, as we were talking to other people about the Lord. And finally we made our way over to this person. And I don't know if it was John that started the conversation or I did, because we always went together. And we simply says, you've been listening? And this person said, yes. Do you want to know that your na name is written in the book of life? Yes, I do. Do you want to pray? Yes, I do. You never know who's w willing and waiting to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We as believers have the responsibility is to share our faith with whoever God puts in our, our lives. That person might be the next person that you're talking to. They, they're looking for salvation. They're looking for hope in a very, very hopeless world that we live in this day. And we have the sure word, the sure hope that we find in Jesus Christ. We have the more sure word, a prophecy that we could believe in. Why don't we go to the Lord in prayer, Father?